This is my beloved Annie Pro Gateron Switch Blue Switches 60% Mechanical Keyboard. This thing is a beast and I've been wanting to talk about this for a while. Listen to this. So clicky. I've never had a keyboard that was this satisfying to type on like these Gateron Blue Switches are. I know what you're thinking, like, yeah, there's lots of people who do videos on mechanical keyboards, but this is my first mechanical keyboard. And this is a big deal for me because I'm in love, man, and I can't go back. So I picked this thing up about six months ago, um, paid full pop for it, $100, which now uh, I'll link below, but there are eBay sellers that are selling version two, this is version one, version two for 45 bucks. I might have to invest in that. Why? Because for me, I've always had a strange relationship with keyboards and this being my first mechanical keyboard, I wanted to do things right. So let's talk about some of the things that make this keyboard pretty awesome. Number one, of course, are the switches. Hold that thought. The wind decided to blow right when I started recording. So number one are the switches. The switches sound amazing. They feel amazing. There's this, this audible click noise right at the actuation point. It makes you feel like you really, you know when you hit those buttons. My typing accuracy is gone. Well, at least it feels like it's gone quite a bit up. The other part, of course, is the RGB. So you have your, I have it on white right now. There's different modes, including my favorite, which is crawling rainbow mode that goes across the keyboard. The keycaps this use are actually completely compatible with the very popular Cherry MX style keycaps. I was able to get some custom keys made for my particular board setup. Of course, my favorite being the gnome footprint and of course the giant oops button. Oops, 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 oops. As it sits right now, there is no Linux integration for the default firmware um, for controlling the RGB. There's a kind of a sketchy app from the company, the manufacturer, uh, Ubbins. Ubbins makes a very sketchy Android app that I sideloaded onto my phone and was able to do some somewhat minimal modifications. But for the most part, the default ones are pretty good. I have yet to look into the third party firmware. There is an open source firmware someone has made for this exact keyboard and I'm hoping it kind of fixes some of these little issues. The keyboard also has different modes. There's like a gaming mode that will turn the WSD into up, down, left, right by default. There's another gaming mode where it'll convert, I, can't, I think it's the Alt, FN, and question mark key to gaming keys. But uh, I, honestly, I would say if you are into gaming, um, one, 60% is probably not the best option. And two, um, I'd probably go with more linear switches than these, these kind of clackety ones. So let's go into the other part, the USB slash Bluetooth functionality. Now, USB, it works like any other keyboard. You plug it in, it shows up, it works. It's perfect as a USB keyboard. However, the Bluetooth keyboard is a slightly different situation. They did send along this little proprietary Aubin's Bluetooth module that I plug into my Linux machine, doesn't even show up. LS USB shows nothing. My onboard Bluetooth, it will connect, but there is a noticeable delay in between the keys presses and when the keys actually show up on screen. Having said that, the experience on Android is actually quite smooth. When I pair it with my Android phone, um, it's it's very seamless. Not quite as seamless as the USB, but still fine for getting things done. And now let's just talk about some of the downsides. Again, some of these might be solved by third-party firmware, but one of the biggest downsides is there's no way to turn this keyboard off. I put it in my bag the other day and I pulled it out and it was switched to some other mode. I believe it was the, uh, it was like a Macintosh mode. And so half the buttons I wanted to hit weren't working the way I expected them to and I had to figure out how to change that mode. Version 2 solves this. They have a physical on-off toggle. 
Another downside, um, which is to be expected for the old one, USB, um, a micro USB versus USB-C, another thing solved by version two. The Bluetooth settings, hopefully that'll be something I'll try out when I get the nerve to swap this out to the other firmware. Right now it's my main keyboard, so I'm kind of scared to do anything that might brick my daily driver. Battery life. So with the backlight on, this thing only gets about three hours of usage. So if you're out remote playing or typing, um, you got to have the backlight off. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not like I spend very many hours typing in the dark or on a device that doesn't have a cable, but it's nice to be able to get a full day's work with the backlight on if I needed to. I just want that as an option. That would be a great option. When it comes to recommending it, do I recommend this keyboard? I recommend the version two because you can pick it up for the same price now. It's got all the features I like, plus it fixes some of the other things. However, I do not know if it supports this open source firmware. If I do get around to getting this firmware set up, I will do a follow up and tell you about what benefits that firmware has, not just as a firmware, but as a open source platform connected to a Linux box. Let me know if you are interested in any more keyboard and peripheral videos. On that note, guys, I will catch you guys on the next one. Peace.